By the end of the first week of Operation Barbarossa, all three German army groups had won major battles on the frontiers and had shattered every counter-attack which had been thrown at them. The German high command was jubilant and there was already talk of reaching Moscow within a fortnight. Hitler told his followers, to all intents and purposes, the Russians have lost the war. The euphoria would last barely a week. Events would occur on the Central Front that changed Hitler's mood from exuberance to extreme anxiety. To the astonishment of German soldiers, the encircled Russian forces in the pockets of Minsk and Bialystok were fighting on, even when their situation was plainly hopeless. Mopping up was taking far too long and costing too many German casualties. The German infantry, with no motor transport, had been slow to seal the encirclements and many Russians were escaping the net, the very thing that Hitler had been most anxious to avoid. Although 290,000 Russian prisoners were marched westwards, and 1,500 guns and 2,500 tanks were destroyed or captured, a quarter of a million Russian soldiers would evade the trap or fight their way back to Soviet lines. As Hitler and his commanders realized that the victories at Bialystok and Minsk had been only partial, there were bitter recriminations. Hitler blamed the leaders of Army Group Center, particularly the Panzer generals, for leaving gaps in the ring. The Panzer leaders, for their part, were deeply frustrated. For almost a week, their advance east had been stopped while they closed the pocket and waited for the infantry to catch up. They feared that if the momentum of the armoured offensive was lost, further east, Russian resistance would stiffen behind the rivers Dnieper and Davina. On July the 3rd, Joseph Stalin made his first broadcast to the Soviet people since the start of the German invasion. Laying aside the cloak of communist ideology, he appealed for a patriotic war. There would be no surrender, and everything that could be of use to the invader was to be destroyed in his path. Behind the lines, partisan bands were to be formed, and meantime, the strategy was to defend the Soviet Union as far to the west as possible, where most of its population and its industries were based. Provision was being made to dismantle key factories which lay in the path of the invader, and ship them east, along with their skilled workers. But it would all take time. Terrified that the Soviet state faced complete collapse, Stalin quickly introduced the harshest penalties for those accused of being panic mongers, cowards or incompetents. In the following weeks, Pavlov, the commander of West Front, was executed, along with members of his staff. As for lesser commanders, many who had broken out of encirclements were also shot for not having resisted to the end. Meanwhile, on the German side of the lines, captured Red Army soldiers thought to be communists, commissars or Jews were handed over by the army to SS special action groups for immediate execution. In the months to come, many Red Army units would fight to the bitter end because their leaders dared neither surrender nor retreat. 
On the same day as Stalin called for a great patriotic war, the panzer leaders of Army Group Center at last got the go-ahead to resume their drive east. The main panzer forces had been static for almost a week, and now, on the very day the general offensive was resumed, the weather broke. A sudden rainstorms, typical of early July, turned the sandy tracks into streaming rivers of mud. The advancing armoured divisions found themselves immobile for hours at a time. All the while, the Russian defence became more determined. Many bridges were blown, and for the first time, mines were laid to slow the German advance. An easy task with the convoys confined to the very few roads. The delays gave the Soviets time to organise for a massive armoured counterblow. The ultimate objective for Army Group Centre was the city of Smolensk, which commanded the road to Moscow. Facing the Germans, along the rivers Dnieper and Davina, were stretches of the old Stalin line fortifications. The defenders were 13th Army of the West Front and the 22nd, 20th and 21st Armies of the Supreme Command Reserve. Another army, the 19th, was forming up at Vitebsk, while the 16th was arriving at Smolensk. It was the threat in the north from Panzer Group 3's 39th Panzer Corps that most worried the Russians. On July the 6th, 20th Army's 7th and 5th Mechanized Corps launched an attack with 700 tanks. The Germans had overwhelming air support and in a three-day battle, the two Soviet mechanized corps were virtually wiped out. Meanwhile, 20th Panzer Division won a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Davina and threatened Vitebsk. To the south, away from the main crossings, Panzer Group II launched surprise attacks, forcing the river Dnieper. The 13th Army was pushed back, losing five divisions. As both German panzer groups drove east, three Soviet armies faced the prospect of encirclement around Smolensk. South of Smolensk, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group advanced at speed and its 29th Motorized Infantry Division took the city on July the 16th. However, to the north, Hoth's 3rd Panzer was moving much more slowly. The terrain was swampy, the rain was still a problem and the Russians were fighting desperately to escape the trap that was developing. On July the 18th, the great armoured pincers of the two panzer groups came within 10 miles of closing. But the jaws would not finally snap shut for another eight days. In the end, although 300,000 Russians were captured, more than 200,000 would break out to stand between the Germans and Moscow. By now, nearly four weeks into the campaign, it was obvious to German commanders and to Adolf Hitler himself that the number of divisions the Red Army could field had been grossly underestimated. There was no sign that the Soviet Union was about to collapse. In fact, there were worrying threats to the flanks of Army Group's centre.